Accessory movements indicate a failure of the main movers. Accessory just means extra or in some ways an unnecessary part or an unnecessary contraction in a movement. And this is true of any part of the body and any movement of the body, whether it's breathing or the way we walk or the way we lift. If the main muscles or joints that should be contributing mostly to a movement cannot do so, then something is wrong and you're going to be overusing, overtaxing the other muscles or joints that should only be assisting with the process. So you are wasting energy and effort at that point. Potentially, you're also more likely to get an injury. It's not as likely, but it's possible. And this is actually especially so if it's a constant activity, such as breathing. Breathing. Its main muscle is the respiratory diaphragm. Most people know this one uh, relatively well at this point. And it's a dome-shaped muscle that kind of converges on itself from the lower attachments of the ribs and, you know, a couple of vertebrae down below. This dome shape, because it is like this, because it's shaped like this, and because it basically sections off the rib cage from the abdominal region, when that muscle contracts and the dome essentially drops out, it increases the size. It increases the size of this thoracic cavity and the lungs along with it, two of them, one on each side. And it allows us to draw air in through our trachea, O2 at this point. Relative relaxation when that dome size uh, allows itself to go back up, of course, we get an expulsion of CO2. And so we get the reverse, and this is all very good. Looking at it just from a more of a simplified side view, if we go here, this is just the bottom of the rib cage. You've got your xiphoid process right here, and then the ribs on either side of that, making a very strange looking M. Hey guys, the respiratory diaphragm is this red thing here, and it moves about a centimeter on, on most breaths, we'll say centimeter down, and it'll drop to a lower point, that's the inhalation, and when it comes back up, that is what we call an exhalation. From the side, just so we've got a nice clear view, again, you can see it's got the dome shape. It goes, I'm summarizing here, but it goes kind of like that, if we do a bit of a cross section right through the middle. And so when we breathe, the dome shape drops out, and it or sorry, when we breathe in, the dome shape drops out as we breathe in. I know that's complicated, but the muscle contracts and we increase the space. We increase the space of the thorax, decreasing the air pressure, even more annoying, but decreasing the pressure and drawing air in. And that's basically how it works in a really simple way. Now, the thing about this respiratory diaphragm is that it is supposed to do the majority, I'll say the majority, not all of, majority of contraction for the purpose of breathing when we're in a restful state. So if you're laying down and you've been laying down for a while, most of the air movement should just be by the respiratory diaphragm. There's a little bit of rib motion, a little bit of rib motion. It's not totally gone. It's not all respiratory diaphragm. But as we increase our activity, there's more and more rib motion necessary to help increase the size of this thoracic region. And it's it's really, really simple. Whatever makes it bigger, whatever direction of pull makes it bigger, that's the answer. So you could look at it as expanding forward and here, but also up. So it's forward and up at the same time. It's like an oblique axis. We get a little bit of a backwards go on the thoracic spine. We call that spinal extension, and it just makes it go a little bit higher. And that's in conjunction with a lateral movement, lateral and up, again, combined motion at the sides here. So lateral is to the outside. And so as we increase these angles here, we get a bigger thoracic cage, we get a negative pressure, we get more air drawn in. And that's done, again, with the more physical effort we, we create, more exertion, that's done by specific muscles. So the small ones, these are, these are tiny, they go through all the ribs. I'm just going to draw a few. They're called the external intercostal. This is the star. This is the closest, deepest accessory muscles. They're kind of like that, and they run roughly in that orientation. And they work in a very simple way. If this one, so this set right here, this set right here, pulls up, 
and the next one pulls that up, and the next one pulls that up, and the top is fixed by some muscles we'll talk about in a second, then the rib cage as a whole goes up. Individually, they would just seize the ribs up. You can, they can do that. But, but as a unit, if they all contract together, they can pull and lift the ribs up. Pretty cool. Okay, another one is the scalene muscles. They attach to these little bumpy bits on the side of the, let me get a better pen size, there we go, on the side of the cervical spine, and they'll attach into the first two ribs roughly. There's a bunch more fibers in that. Looking at it from the front, they attach from here to, let's just say here, just to make it real convenient, there to there. And when they, they pull, they pull in the opposite arrow I've drawn here, but they pull and they lift those two ribs up. So they'll do essentially that, making the vertical expansion that much bigger. There is another one, again, just throwing it on the side here. We've got something called the sternocleidomastoid. That means it attaches to the mastoid process of the skull into the sternum clavicle area. And so looking at it from the front again, you wouldn't see this visibly here, but it'll attach into this region about here. Again, it will pull up like so. Again, expanding the rib cage like that, expanding it and generally in an upward from the top. So creating more of that vacuum. We've also got, this is a fun one, uh, the pectoralis minor, or pec minor, most people call it. And it will attach from the scapula, we'll just keep it that, scapula, and it'll attach to at least ribs three, four, and five. And again, just based on the angle it's gonna pull from, you're gonna see as it pulls upward, it lifts those ribs, ribs three, four, and five. These are, of course, bilateral. They happen on both sides. It's not just a one-sided muscle thing. Um, and so again, it's it's lifting the ribs up in general. We could make a case for, and I always like to, we could make a case for a muscle called the serratus anterior, because that goes to ribs one to eight. Um, I'm going to leave that one alone for now. It's an interesting one. It's one of my favorite muscles. But I'm going to make more of a case for the spinal extensor muscles. So these spinal extensor muscles actually go from, pick a nice teal for this one, they go from all the way from the top to the bottom, and there'll be many, many branches. They look, it's more like, it's more looking like this, but that takes too long to draw. The complexity is amazing. But anyways, when they pull, they do kind of exactly what I've drawn here. They can cinch up, they, they shorten the posterior line, if you will, so it brings this together. And because the lower body is a little more fixed than the upper body, you're going to see generally the whole upper body draw back. And that gives us vertical expansion. So it allows us, if the diaphragm is contracting, it will allow us to draw the body away from the respiratory diaphragm, increasing that vacuum, that, that space. And so that works relatively well. Again, these are fine to use. It's totally fine that these are contracting, that they're assisting with breathing, provided provided that we're physically exerting ourselves. If we are not, and you see these muscles very active at rest, something is a problem, something is an issue, and this person has some kind of a flaw in the system. It's accessory muscle use. It's accessory during quiet breathing, and so it's an unnecessary during quiet breathing, or at least it should be. Now, just as a little disclaimer, if there is a known lung pathology or a lung disease, then that's a different case. This person has some kind of lung damage. That's, that's, if it's a disease, there's, there's probably been some damage, and they are doing the best they can. They, if they, you are lacking one of your lungs, it's, it's not unheard of to have a collapsed lung and to ne not be able to have it repaired, and you go the rest of your life on one lung. Well, you're going to need some extra help. The muscles are just doing exactly what they need to to keep you going as best they can, and that's fine. You, I think you can still help that person, but just understand different standards. But let's say it's not a disease. Let's just say we see someone who's having to move their whole body just to breathe normally. Consider that the diaphragm is not working well at that point. And I'm going to give you one example. There could be multiple. So for instance, let's say the body is kind of pitched, pitched forward. I've done a little outline of the body here. They're pitched forward, what we call a general flexed pattern. Again, the diaphragm is 
right about here. And the person is now dropping down through their rib cage, they're dropping down through their lumbar spine, they're dropping down into the abdominal region from their thorax. Now, a couple things can happen in this case. Again, going back to that, a little bit of a simplified view, what tends to happen, if you look at this shape, I've seen this many times, the bottom of the thorax has a nice smooth curve, a nice smooth curve like that downward. Well, when we pitch forward, when we go into that flexion, it seems that the infrasternal angle, this angle here, or just the bottom, the ribs tend to flare out. They're kind of, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course, they tend to flare out like this. What this does is it separates, or at least creates a greater distance, as it kind of flips up like that, creates a greater distance between the attachment points, the lateral attachment points of the diaphragm, and this flattens it out. The diaphragm really does need to have that dome shape. Again, it needs that dome shape to properly go down or up either direction. So already the breathing is going to be at least slightly affected by this. This person will be able to breathe, of course, They'll still be able to use the diaphragm, but it's not nearly as efficient. Now, something else that's, that's really neat is you do have stuff underneath that respiratory diaphragm. This doesn't get mentioned enough, but it's, you know, blatantly obvious if you know a little bit of anatomy. There is a whole bunch of guts underneath here. That's your small intestine and your liver and your pancreas and all that. And those abdominal viscera is the technical term. Liver, uh, gallbladder too, of course. Um, beneath that we have the, the pelvic organs. But anyways, the diaphragm, its job is to constantly on and off pressure on those guts and it does help with some blood return it's very good that they get squashed but there's a limit as you bend into again we're bending into this position bending in compressing our tummy we do have some give and the abdominal muscles here you know that's that's very possible that those outpouch but there's a limit and so we start to increase the pressure a little we increase the pressure in our abdominal region and that is a factor that pushes back against that respiratory diaphragm descending. So it's gonna have a little bit of a harder time descending when that's the case. So these two combined things can make it a little bit harder. And because we don't have proper up and down respiratory diaphragm motion, you might see that it's harder to take a deep breath in or out. Another way of looking at it though is rib motion. Let me just pop this up here. So looking at this, we're looking at this one from the side. These ribs are attached at a few different points. They're attached in the back and the front. You could look at the side as an attachment too, but back and the front are going to be the main ones. And they are all joints. They are all joints. That means they're separated by spaces and bones. So this is a cross section. This is a cut right through the middle. And in the back here is a vertebrae, two ribs, and then we'll have a sternum in the front. And they're all attached through a few different means. In the back, it's more of a ligamentous attachment. So it's thick tissues, really strong tissues, in fact, between synovial joints. And they are synovial joints. So they're fluid-based joints. In the front, they are cartilage joints between the ribs and the sternum. And any of these tissues, the bones, of course, are deformable. The bones do change over time. But in the short term, we can have tissue rigidity set in. So where it used to be a moving structure based on, however this happened, based on time and pressure and strain, as these tissues thicken, it gets harder to actually move these ribs up and down. So what was before, what was before a, a swinging tissue that went up and down and back and forth all the time, now does not move nearly as well. It's not rock solid, but it's not moving well. So suddenly we have to engage a lot more external musculature just to get a normal breathing activity. So someone who has these issues, whether, whether you know, if you want to help this person, whether you want to soften up some of these joints, whether you want to get them a bit better situated in space so that they don't have to deal with the excess pressure, you can, you can benefit, you yourself or someone else can benefit quite greatly from this. If you're having to move your entire body every time you breathe, you may find that life's just, just a bit easier if you can breathe without having to constantly wobble back 
and forth and back and forth for the foreseeable future.